Thank you. Do you have uh, maybe time for one or two more questions? Second round? Maybe just another one? Yes, please. Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I'm the representative of the platform. I really enjoy your speech and also the response to some of the questions. Uh, I have also shared your view that for some of the uh, global issues uh, facing us, such as climate change, all countries, big or small, should be part of the solution. So I have a question about the UNFCCC. About? Uh -huh. UNFCCC. No. Uh, especially the upcoming meeting in Durban. Uh, at the end of November. Uh, so Taiwan will also send a delegation to observe. So you mentioned about your experiences um, in Copenhagen and then Cancun. But now it comes to uh, Durban. Do you think that this is a decisive moment? Because next year, the Kyoto Protocol will expire. So do you, uh, do you feel that you are under pressure uh, for the European Union or for Belgium to press for a solution? Because there will be thousands of delegates Go in there. It will be a big gathering. So, how do we see the prospect? So, will there be a solution, say, for the future? Thank you. Thank you. Maybe one, one last one. Final question. Yes, please. Yeah, please. Professor Frank from the University of Manila. Mr. Minister, before deleting unanimity from the CFSP, maybe it would be good to try to experiment the constructive abstentionist we introduced in the Amsterdam Treaty and we never uh, uh, use an experiment. And if I may say, mm -hmm. I don't think it would have been possible to experiment the constructive abstentionism in the case of the proclamation of Palestine as a state. But I would like to ask you if you could deliver a, a comment about how the, the Union has behaved towards uh, this uh, rather difficult situation. Thank you. I'm so sorry, you have a very short question perhaps? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Robert Hitler, exchange student at VUB. Uh, I'm from Czech Republic, and it reaches a really small country as Belgium. And uh, I wondered if you told that uh, to gain progress in common policies, you support um, decisive, decisive methods which uh, don't require uh, too much of unity, uh, which is uh, understandable. But I just wondered if you uh, are not afraid uh, that our votes of our countries, such uh, as small countries, uh, won't, won't lose in such conditions. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Nice questions. Uh, your question on Durban is. Uh, if you say, is Durban going to be decisive? No, it is not going to be decisive. It will not be the last conference that this world will be needing in order to, to solve the problem. It will, I hope, as it was the case in Cancun, give real progress. And in my view, real progress should essentially be based not first and foremost on speeches, but on implementation. I honestly hope that getting to the implementation of what is agreed is probably one of the focal points on which we have to concentrate. Um, it is something that is very much alive in, in our country, in uh, the European public opinion, as being of crucial importance. We know that uh, some of the countries tackle the problem with a comparison of uh, who has created the problem. And those who have created the mess, they, have, they should solve it. I think that another comparison is as, as useful. It's about a ship that is sinking. And when a ship is sinking, you can ask, most of the time afterwards, who has created the hole? But while the ship is sinking, you're all hosing. Everybody is hosing. Also those who did not create the problem in the first place. And I honestly look upon all the partners to acknowledge that it is not only about blame, it is also about action. And uh, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And in that respect, the whole discussion on climate change is, of course, it very intimately linked to the logic of uh, fair development and uh, the Millennium uh, Development Goals. I think the countries, like, my, like our countries, need to take into account that some of the interlocutors are awaiting us when it comes to the discussion of the Millennium Development Goals. But on the other hand, I think that some of the countries 
that are in the situation uh, of, of development have to understand that in, in order to save the planet and to avoid uh, tremendous um, problems for, for countries that are vulnerable, everybody is going to have to uh, do some effort. And is Durban going to be decisive? I'm not so sure, but I'm quite optimistic that it will give new progress and we will be very voluntaristic as far as we are concerned. Perhaps a last comment. We will absolutely avoid, uh, as a European Union, the mistake of Copenhagen. We will not only come with a message and not a capacity to, to, to engage and discuss. It will be about Commission and, of course, also those representing the Member States having a joint position and speaking and debating and trying to come to an agreement. The idea of the constructive abstention is a nice one. Uh, we can also think about enhanced cooperation for, for those who are willing. In fact, uh, in some recent events we had a little bit the coalition of the willing, in a sense. Uh, perhaps that's also... So, constructive abstention, enhanced cooperation, having a look at the majority rule or the uh, unanimity rule, every instrument that makes us more credible when it comes to saying when Europe has a say about the subject matter, it is also capable of uh, adding the, 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 the concrete conclusions even on a, on a front which is uh, perhaps military. So that is the crucial uh, effort that has to be solved. Uh, if it's to be solved with constructive abstention, depends a little bit on, uh, on uh, how this abstention is used uh, and if it is still accompanied by a logic of a real veto. Because if the veto is still there, you can never tell for sure that a country is not going to block you. On Palestine, this is the hardest one. First you get me tired, and then at the end <laughs> you talk about Palestine. Um, I have said in the United Nations speech of Belgium that Palestine has reached a level of statehood that the world cannot ignore. That was my message to the Palestinians, to say you cannot continue to uh, ignore the fact that also through the, with the help of, uh, of Belgian and European budgets, uh, money, today the Palestinian uh, Authority has reached a level of statehood. I, I don't want to engage in, 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 uh, in comparisons, but okay, the world has recognized South Sudan as a new state in this world. And I welcome South Sudan really very, uh, without any hesitation. But still, could we ask the question, if all the levels of judiciary, policing, uh, fiscal uh, policies, uh, administration, are they all in place in South Sudan? And compare this one second with what the Palestinian Authority now has as a capacity of do doing the things that a state has to do. I ask the question and you see that uh, asking the question is giving the answer. Now this being said, so the Palestinians have reached a level of statehood which we cannot ignore. I, should, I would like to quote Jonas Stör, the, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Norway, who is not a member of the European Union but has, has sound views on, on how to... When in Oslo I talked to, to Jonas, he told me, recognizing a country is not about recognizing a dream. It is about recognizing a reality. And if we want the Palestinian state to be a reality, and we all want that, at least in the European Union, the, the, the thesis is very clear, and in 2009, by the end of 2009, we absolutely clearly stated the two-state solution with all the conditions. If we want to make sure that this really happens, not only in the resolutions in the, in the United Nations, but on the ground, it has to become a reality, and there, there is no other answer than it has to be achieved through negotiations. And that is the, no, the, how difficult it might be, it is through negotiations. What we need to explain, and I consider myself a friend of the Palestinians and a friend of the Israeli people, it is not an act of hostility to explain to a government that the status quo is not in the interest of uh, the, the, of, of the people of, of Israel. And I, expla I explain that to the, the Israeli government. We have relationships with countries. We're not engaging with governments, we're engaging with countries. 
And we try to explain that they as well, they have to understand that status quo is not the solution. Negotiations have to be real. And in order to have real negotiations, you have to have the will of, negotiate, of negotiating and not the will uh, to, provoc <coughs> to, to do provocative things that uh, make it impossible to, negoti to, to negotiate. Last question on small countries. You know, I have... Uh, formally forbidden my people to use the word small and Belgian in one phrase. <laughs> uh, that is, uh, I, I always say use modest size if you want. <laughs> but small, do not say from, of yourself that you are small. If you are in GDP the 21st, the 21st biggest country of the world, do not consider yourself small when the total investments of the United States in Belgium is bigger than in China. Do not consider yourself the s small if you are the 12th big exporting country of the world. And do never tell people that you are small. They will see it by themselves. Uh, you don't have to uh, attract the attention. I was in, in India and uh, the, the journalist of a, a newspaper that had probably more readers than the Benelux has inhabitants <laughs> she asked me, Mr. Minister, Mr. Belgian Minister, aren't you intimidated by the size of my country, India? Aren't you intimidated? And I said, intimidated, no. Impressed, yes. But intimidated, no, because I never thought I was big in the first place. <laughs> Only if you think of yourself as being big, then you can get intimidated by somebody bigger. The Belgians do not have that attitude, but I do not call myself small. And your question about let's say, modest-sized countries in Europe. Are they, going to, are they going to lose their grip if at one point it is about majority voting or uh, qualified majority voting? Take a good look at Belgium. We have, amongst our compatriots, we have the President of the European Union. We have the Commissioner of probably one of the most important portfolios, Commerce. And I am under the impression that when the Belgian Minister of Foreign Affairs speaks, very often he creates the consensus. Because he's, let's say, smart enough to recognize that he has two ears and only one mouth, so that he has to listen twice as much as uh, speaking. So I think if you are able to be wise about your choices, even as a not too big country, you can have a lot of influence. And the comfort of knowing that you can block any decision is a very relative comfort. Because if you're on a boat or in a car that is parked and that is not go going anywhere, the, the, the pleasure of, of saying, I could block everybody here, is very relative. Especially in a world that is moving at the pace that is moving today. Thank you very much. So, Minister, thanks again for sharing your insights so uh, extensively and also enjoyably. Um, it was a very, very great uh, event. And we were very sorry for tying you out. But we do have now uh, a reception outside. We invite you all for some refreshments. I also would like to point out that this is, of course, the highlight of the lecture series. But further lectures are upcoming on cybersecurity, on NATO, and Libya. Um, so please do join us again. For today, I would thank you uh, in the name of the Institute for European Studies and the Values College. And we do have as a small <coughs> token of appreciation, light reading, Modest size. light reading produced uh, the three most recent publications, and uh, one on EU and Asia, the second on EU, UN and NATO, and the third one on EU and Turkey. Thank so, you uh, very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.